It's been a year of making woodworking videos for YouTube. From zero subscribers to over a thousand, and from my first video up to 30. Hey, it's Jim from the Woodworking Corner, and in today's video, we're going to relive the last year of making videos. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, sit back, and relax as we relive the last year of making videos. It was in November of 2023 that I decided to make videos for YouTube. With nothing slated, I had to come up with some idea of what to make for my first video. That's when I decided to reorganize my router bits. Being a woodworker is nothing new to me. Being a woodworker in front of a camera, well, that's a different story. Does the phrase, a deer in headlights mean anything to you? Let's take a look back at my first video. Hi, I'm Jim from the Woodworking Corner, and today I ditched this French cleat tool holder for my hand for my handheld router. It was a tough decision because this tool holder has been one of my all-time favorites. But recently, I took the challenge of adding a router table to the outfield side of my table saw. Here's the my cut list. So uh, yeah, I only need seven pieces of wood to do this, and it's uh, time to start breaking down the the material. And like magic, here they all go. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. I'm using a one and a half inch Forstner bit to uh, do the holes, and then I will join the holes. Here's the installation of the drawer slides. This is actually the first time I'm doing it this way. I've always done it in a different way uh, that I might explain in a different video. But what I'm doing is I'm putting a spacer at the bottom and that spacer, you put the drawer slide on top of that and then you can get your, this way you know your, your straight going back and forth. Um, here I am drilling some pilot holes and then screwing in a couple of screws. And then I'll end up using more screws in a little bit. And then what I did was I got a, uh, a longer spacer for the top rail. So I put that right on top of the bottom rail and then you can install the slide for the top. I'm using that block of wood as a spacer in the front. So this way, when the drawer is closed, it's flush with the side of the cabinet. Um, I didn't want it to stick out like a normal uh, drawer face. So this one is flush with the side of the, of the, of the workbench. With that board that I use for the spacer in between the two slides, I used at the bottom to give it a little space at the bottom. So this lifts the drawer up 
And then what you do is you just pull the slide out and you start screwing them in little by little. And then once it gets a little bit too far out, then you just take the whole thing out, which I'm about to do here. And then you just finish putting in the screws. Now here comes the fun part, getting to load everything into my new drawer. For the most part, all my routers fit except for the, the straight ones. They go right down to the bottom. Um, so what I might do is just put something at the bottom to keep them from falling out. But otherwise, I'm just going to throw them out on top. Um, Thank you for watching this episode. And uh, and I hope you give it a like and, uh, and subscribe to the channel. I'm looking forward to doing more videos. It's no surprise to me that the video hasn't even gotten a thousand views yet. My second video really wasn't a woodworking video, but it was a project I wanted to do. I figured it helped me with my film and editing skills. And as you can tell from my excitement in the video, I was very happy on how this project turned out. I'm very happy with the turnout of this project. My latest project is a budget friendly and easy to put up and down backyard golf enclosure. Recently, my wife bought me this golf net for my birthday. After some use, I realized it was a great net for chipping and pitching. It does handle full swings with no problem as long as you're close to it. After a couple days of hitting balls into the net, I realized I had no idea how well I was hitting the ball. This led me to thinking about getting a launch monitor. Only one problem. Based on the instructions, it's recommended to have the ball placement and the net eight feet apart. I felt confident hitting balls into the net at a range of about four feet eight feet away, well, it might as well have been 80 feet away. In fact, my confidence fell greatly after I shanked one over the fence. And if I did that, there was no way I was going to allow anyone else to hit balls this way. I never slice. Then it happened again. After being so careful, I shanked the second one over the fence. That's when I put the golf clubs away. So after putting up four poles, it was time for the net. And there was the epic fail. There was no way that the poles were going to hold the net upright, and it was obvious that four poles were not going to be enough. The other three poles were necessary to keep the net from sagging in the middle, and the poles will have to be cemented in. So back to the big box store to get the added supplies. Now, we could have just cemented the poles in, in the middle of the yard, that would look weird and it would be a tripping hazard. So my thought was to put the enclosure up against the trees and when I'm not using the net, the trampoline can be here too. I'm very happy with the turnout of this project and I do feel a hell of a lot safer with friends hitting balls on this. I have always been a fan of French cleats. I have one here. Here's another one. Here's one for my orbital sander. And even my drill holder is on French cleats. But did you know you could use French cleats outside the workshop? Let's take a look. Hey, it's Jim from the Woodworking Corner. In today's video, I'm gonna show you ways you can use the French cleat system outside of the workshop. In the past, I've used a door with a hinge, but the door wouldn't stay flush, so then I ended up putting a latch on this side. And after time, I didn't like the way it looked. I wanted something that was a little bit more hidden. Using a couple of French cleats around the electrical box and attaching them to a panel like this, find a great way to hide the electrical box. One more use for a French cleat is here in the shed. I hung my leaf blower up on the, the shed door. Makes for a great space for, for my leaf blower. Now here's the money saving idea. I did it on a TV once before and it worked out very well. I added a French cleat to the back of the TV and hung it up on the wall and it came out nice. So instead of buying a TV bracket, I do this now. The bar TV isn't the only TV I hung up with French cleats. I hung this one up with French cleats as well. And there you have it. Three different ways you can use French cleats outside of the workshop. Hey, that's a pretty good looking guy.
I've always tried to make my videos entertaining, educational, and informative. And now that I had a couple of videos in, and Christmas was quickly approaching, I wanted to do a holiday-related project. So here, here I am making a Christmas tree. Hey, Jim from the Woodworking Corner. Today, we are taking a piece of scrap wood like this and transforming it into a Christmas tree like this. So stay tuned. We're gonna have six pieces at six inches. And that's from point to point. That's one, two, three, four, five, and then this guy down here is six. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna move our blade over to 30 degrees. We're going to cut off the first part. We're going to flip the board over. We're going to measure six inches from the point. And what I'd like to do is get the get my saw ready to go, but don't make the cut yet. Make sure everything looks like it's lined up. And then I'd like to get a stop lock and get that set. Make sure everything is still set up, which it looks good. Now, very important when making cuts with a with a stop lock. Make sure the saw blade stops completely before you lift the blade after the cut. Next, we're going to bring everything over to the sander. That was taking a while. I realized that this sandpaper definitely needs changing. So let me change that out really fast. Okay, with brand new sandpaper on, we can continue. Now this part's totally optional. I just wanted to give it a try to make mine a little bit different than the, than the last one. Take one of the six inch pieces and we're gonna stain it first. What you need is you need some sort of a straight edge board and clamp it down. Start with the base of the tree. So we're gonna take the, the 11 inch and then we are gonna add the two bottoms to it. Now, <clears throat> as we glue it up, this is gonna be sliding around. So what we wanna do is use another clamp and clamp this board down so we don't have to worry about this thing moving. there. So now we have something sturdy to push up against while we, we drive in a nail.
And there you have it. The top of the tree is done. Okay, while the stain is still drying, let's uh, paint this guy. If you're wondering about the fumes from the spray and stuff, I uh, just want to let you know I do have the garage door open. It is raining pretty hard. Okay, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to just get the center line for each one. Uh, this was six inches, so we're just going to make a little mark by three. And then this one. If we do from that to that, that was 11, so that's going to be five and a half. Christmas tree made out of scrap wood. Uh, if you can, let me know in the comment section, which one would you prefer? Um, I think I actually like it with the, the brown base versus all green. I think the all green, it just um, blends in too much. And the roundness, I, I think I prefer the roundness over the sharp edges. Um, I like both of them, but I, I think if I had to pick one, I would pick this one, but I'd like to know what you think. So let me know. Thanks and have a good day. One of my next projects was a fireplace insert. And I thought it'd do really well because on, <clears throat> on the YouTube shorts, it seemed to do pretty popular. Like it was getting a lot of views on, on YouTube for the, at least on the short side. So I thought I'd make a long form video of building a fireplace insert. But to date, it's still one of my lowest ranking uh, videos that I've made. Let's take a look. Hey, it's Jim from the Woodworking Corner. I'm going to show you how you can save a ton of money by making your own custom electric fireplace. With some imagination and some basic woodworking techniques, you can turn this into this. Let's get started. Once you have a design in mind, you have to build a frame for the insert to sit in. This one called for an opening of 33 inches by 26 inches. After you build the frame for the insert, the next step is to cover the frame. You could use sheetrock for this. I opted for half inch plywood. The options you decide for your fireplace are endless. I wanted to add some shelves to the side of mine. I opted for a more minimal look, but so added some edge banding to hide the ply in the plywood. Here's a pro tip. Give all the inside faces of your shelves or cabinets a coat of paint before you assemble them. You'll thank me later. Shelves like cabinets can be put together with many different types of joinery. I haven't used my biscuit joiner in a while, so I decided to give it a whirl. By using glue and biscuits for my joinery, you don't have to worry about any nail holes to fill in. Now that the frame is done and the shelves are built, we can tie them all together with some crown and base molding. Fill in the seams with some wood putty, chalk, or spackle. Since I wanted to finish the fireplace with paint, spackle is a great choice and could be used to hide some imperfections in the plywood. Finally, it's time for installation. And here, the final review. So all of that and still one of my lowest viewed videos. My next project after that, I'm surprised, was actually two pieces of wood being put together, got more views, way more views at the time, at over 4,800 views 
And it was just me literally putting two pieces of the wood together and putting it on the side of my workbench over here. So let's check out The Struggle is Real. Hey, it's Jim from the Woodworking Corner. Table saw is out at the shop today, so I'm trying to find some things to do around the shop that I can improve on without the use of a table saw until I get it back hopefully sometime next week. I don't know about you, but air hoses is a big pet peeve of mine. You roll them up, they look nice and fine and dandy and stuff like that. But maybe you're just doing something over here with an air gun and you don't need 20 foot of hose. No way of doing it unless you find some sort of a spool to put it on. Okay, here's my thought. An old piece of uh, two by three from a old project. All I'm thinking about doing is, here's the side of the cabinet here. Just gonna cut this down and do something vertically like this. And we'll clean it up a little bit and make it look pretty. YouTube shorts are entertaining, informative, and sometimes you could use them to promote your long videos. I did a whole bunch of shorts over the course of the year, and some of them were informative, while other ones were for promotions. Here's a few of them that I've done. No template, no problem. Hey, it's Jim from the Woodworking Corner again. How many times have you tried to hang one of these things up, but can't seem to get the hole right? And we're gonna do it all without using a ruler. All you need, pen and paper. Take a piece of paper, grab some tape, to tape it down. Sketch over the area where the holes are. And now we have our template. Bring your template to the wall where you wanna mount your object. Grab a hole punch or something sharp and Find the top of the hole, peel off the tape and the paper, and test fit your piece. Works every time. When attaching two items, it's always important to drill a hole first before attaching the screw. But it's equally important to make sure you use the right size drill bit too. Let me show you how to find that out. When picking the right size drill bit, what you want to do is look at 
not the threads, but the shaft of the screw minus the threads. Try and match that up as best as possible with the drill bit. This one looks okay, but to be honest, this one's just a little bit too narrow. This one here, that one fits perfect. Let's try that one out. Okay, I just finished planing all these boards over here. Um, my setup is I have the, the Bauer planer over here going into my the wall dust separator that's over here. And this is going into the Stealth Sonic. And the wood chips, most of the wood chips is going down in this. Let's see what's uh, actually going on in here. This is everything I've already done so far. And this one uh, well, went a little too high. I still filled the whole thing up on that one. So that garbage can is almost filled. I'm very curious to see what it looks like inside of here. Look at that filter. It's like brand spanking new. And there is nothing in the dust bag. This thing looks brand spanking new and I've used it to clean all that wood over there. So there was a few of my shorts. Uh, they did okay. I, nothing, nothing spectacular. But then there was one short I decided to do, and it kind of went viral. At least for me, it went viral. At over 117,000 views, I would consider it kind of viral to me. This one was just a short one-minute video on three different ways of doing measuring. And I couldn't believe how it kind of blew up for my channel. Let's take a look at it. Give me 60 seconds, I'll give you three measuring hacks. Here's a hack for getting the measurement of the inside of a cabinet. Pull out your tape, go to 10, 10 inches, make a mark, flip your tape around the other way, and take the measurement. Eight and a quarter plus 10, 18 and a quarter. You divide this board in half, take the tip of your ruler, and go to an even number on the other side. So I go to 16 here, cut that in half, eight. There's the middle of your board. What if you wanted to cut it into thirds? Move this to 15 and go up by five. Five, 10, 15. You got three even sections. Need the center of a circle, put the point anywhere around the circle, make a mark on the other two sides. Flip it over, any point on the circle, make two more marks. Join the opposing marks. And there's the center of your circle. Because of that video, the comment section started blowing up. And a lot of people were going back and forth on the different ways of measuring. It wasn't very productive to say the least. It did cause me to want to make another video, a long form video this time, on one of the measuring hacks and why I did it the way I did it. Let's go take a look at that one. A couple of weeks ago, I put out a, a YouTube short on measuring hacks. I'll throw that up there wherever it goes in regards to measuring the inside of a cabinet. A lot of slack asking, why not just use the measure on the back of the tape? Well, for starters, like it blends in yellow on yellow, really can't see that. Second, I can't read it unless I have my reading glasses. These, these safety glasses happen to have magnifiers in them. So looking at it, it says three and five eighths inches. So that's the width of this rule. So they're saying, rather than do my method, just take this out and measure it out like that. So I purposely made the inside of this wall, would, if we'll pretend it's a cabinet, whatever, purposely made it 29 and 5 eighths just for this example. So if I put this down and I put this aluminum rule down so I can kind of know where I'm gonna be. So if I put this down and slide this all the way out, the opening to the tape over here comes to 26. 26 plus three and 5 eighths, is 29 and 5 eighths. Very simple. That's very simple math to do, adding three of a 5 eighths to a, to a whole number. I still think it's easier because what we're gonna do is, now we're gonna change this. We're gonna change this to 
it's a 28 and three quarters. Okay. So 28 and three quarters using the same method. You put this, you extend the, extend the tape. The opening here is 25 and an eighth. So now you have to do 25 and an eighth plus three and five eighths. That comes out to 28 and three eighths. I'm, I'm sorry, 28 and six eighths, which reduces down to 28 and three quarters. Math, you gotta do, use pen and paper, whatever like that. I still think my method is a little easier to just measure out 10 inches, make a mark, which I made a mark there, and then come from the other direction and do the same thing and get to 18 and three quarters. 18 and three quarters plus 10 is 28 and three quarters. I think my method is a little bit faster when you have to do, when you have to do it this way when it's not easy numbers to add up quickly in your head uh, and make mathematical errors. Everyone does. One way of skinning a cat versus another way of skinning a cat. It's not that all one way. We can do things different ways. I'm just offering this hack, which I didn't invent. I saw someone else do it and I'm like, well, that sounds, that sounds like a good way of measuring the inside of a cabinet or something. I was glad to see in the comment section after that video that people were being a little bit more objective and subjective and giving out useful information rather than just uh, saying one way is better than the other. The purpose of us creating videos sometimes is to supplement our income. Some people actually do it as a full-time job. Right now, there's no way I can do this as a full-time job. One of the things that does help is doing product review videos. These product review videos are a way for us to get new tools into the shop without having to go out and buy them. But we do get the tools for free in exchange for an honest review on YouTube. So here are some product review videos I've done over the course of the year. Oh, hey, today we are reviewing the DeWall 12 gallon Stealth Sonic shop vac. Let's see how much quieter it is from the standard one. Today I received the DeWall 12 gallon Stealth Sonic shop vac. It boasts the same powerful motor, but yet a quieter motor, up to 50% quieter. But is it really quieter than the standard 12 gallon shop vac? That's what I want to find out. Hearing loss contributes to over 11% of workplace injuries, and 10% of our military personnel have suffered permanent hearing loss despite them wearing hearing protection. And with me personally working on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier for two years, I can say that the sound has wreaked havoc on my hearing. interesting part is I already own a DeWalt 12 gallon shop vac, but I got the standard one a few years back and I have it connected here with my DeWalt dust separator. Here's the current one. We'll pull him out. We'll set him up next to the, the Stealth Sonic one and we'll compare the noise. Um, I have the microphone on my hat. I'm going to use that. I don't have a decibel meter to, to do this with, so I'm just going to use the microphone on my hat. I'm going to put it equally distant to both of them. Uh, we're gonna start with the original standard 12 gallon and then we'll move over to the Stealth and we'll see what the sound difference looks like. It almost sounds like it's in another room when this thing is running. Um, it's, you can almost, they say you should be able to talk comfortably. It's like the same sound level as someone talking comfortably. It is, it's pretty close to that. It, it does sound like somebody is using it in another room.
Today we're taking a closer look at the Ecomax 150 PSI air compressor. This is the Ecomax 6 gallon air compressor. It's their pancake model. You may not recognize the name, but I guarantee you've seen their products around. This product is perfect for small workshops, garages, and homeowners who like to do things around the house. With dual ports, you can run two tools at the same time. At a max of 150 PSI, this tool is perfect for most pneumatic tasks. It's lightweight, weighing under 28 pounds. It makes it very portable. This compressor is very versatile. It takes about two or three minutes for it to fill up. But if you're using a high demanding tool like a sander or a grinder that needs a constant air, this may not be the right tool for you. But for other projects requiring a nail gun or a blower or something like that, this is uh, the perfect tool for that. I've had the, the pleasure of being able to review these two drum fans, um, something perfect for a shop or maybe, maybe not perfect for the shop. Um, let me go through some of the features of each one and let you know uh, my thoughts. First, we're going to start off with the 24 inch the wall drum band over here. Uh, one of the great features about this one is other than it's on wheels and stuff like that, the, the fan can turn 360 degrees, which is great for directing air in a certain direction. Uh, this one is also a variable speed fan. Turning it on right now. This is on a low setting. Uh, if you look at the box, it does say it's supposed to be quieter than a normal drum fan, I guess. Um, I don't have one to compare to, but I'm talking normal conversation and this is on a low speed and it's, uh, it's not that bad. It's, it's almost like white noise. So yeah, that's a nice little, nice little shop. Uh, well, not even little, it's 24 inch, not bad. This one, 30 inch. Uh, this one, as I, yeah, as I was saying before, in terms of better, bigger is better. Uh, I don't know. This one does not rotate um, at all. I mean, it is on wheels too, so it's very, very portable. Uh, it's This one has three speeds. This one's a variable speed one. This one has three settings in the back. I don't feel the air like I feel that one, but what I've noticed is the air is being spread out to the sides. So when you're walking into it nice and straight, there's hardly any air, hardly any air blowing here. All the air is more blowing out to the sides. For my shop, I don't think I'm going to keep this one. Uh, that one over there, definitely. I definitely needed something in the shop. One, to blow dust. Two, to keep me cool in the summer months, because now it's turning into summer right now. And uh, yeah, I think this is the one, the way to go. Uh, um, who do I think they're good for? Uh, this is definitely any, any shop or even white noise in the house. If you like white noise in the house and stuff like that. This one, more, I would say more industrial than, than home. This one I would say is more for, uh, could be for, for gyms like CrossFits and stuff like that, where they don't like to put the AC on because it's such a big place and then they just want everyone to sweat, but they still want air moving. Perfect for that. Industrial warehouse space that you need the air just to circulate around. I think this would be perfect for, uh, for something like that. Uh, that's my review on these two drum fans. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. Today we are wall mounting an air compressor. No, not this one. We are mounting this one. We're reviewing the Craftsman half gallon wall mounted air compressor. I've used Craftsman tools many times in the past, but this is the first time I've seen something like this and I think it's really, really cool. Weighing less than 21 pounds, it makes it very easy to carry around. And one of the things I do like is the fact that it's got a built-in retractable air hose and it's powered by what I'm surprised by, a one and a half horsepower motor where my pancake compressor, this guy here, is not even one horsepower. To get a closer look at it, uh, we got the power button here. Here's the, the pressure for the tank. It comes with a, its own uh, regulator here that you attach to here before you attach it to your other, other tools that you're going to use it with. It has a, an onboard storage for some accessories. 
drain, drain valve is over on this side. It's got a handle on the side for, for carrying. So I think we're ready to turn it on and see how long it's going to take for it to pressurize. It's at zero right now. Let's flip it on and see how long it takes. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> it got up to 120 PSI in oh, 10, 12 seconds. I am I'm very happy with what it does. It's a small, portable, lightweight air compressor that will get the job done for small projects like trim work and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to share with you some of the videos that didn't make it into the year interview video. If your saw is brand new like this one or a couple years old like this one, it's imperative that you do these five things before your next woodworking project. Let's make a new fence for our new table saw. A couple years ago, my daughter asked me to build her a desk, and then, as any good dad would do, I complied. Today, we're doing some edge banding. Definitely one of the most useful jigs or tools to have in your shop is a cross-cut sled for your table saw. Today, I'm going to show you how I made this cool table and umbrella stand for my pool area. So what do I have planned for the new year? Let's take a look at a project I just finished. I haven't finished doing the video part of it, but at least the project itself is done. So let's take a quick look at that. Here in front of me is another project I'm working on. It's the glue up of uh, one of the floating shelves that I'm making for another customer. It's one of eight floating shelves that I'll be making for a customer. Over here is two more of the floating shelves that are already done, uh, getting ready to be finished. Uh, the other, other four are outside and I still have one more to build. It's been a great year of making videos. I definitely learned a lot and I definitely still have a lot more to learn. I want to thank you all for sharing this experience with me and look forward to doing more videos into the new year. If there was a favorite moment or video, please share it with me in the comment section. I'd love to know what it was. Thanks for watching.